Okay, welcome back. So now we're ready to talk about the most important property of semiconductors, the fact that they can be doped. So you recall, metals are good electrical conductors, insulators are poor electrical conductors, semiconductors are sort of in between. They're not good metals, they're not good semiconductors, but they do have a remarkable property. We can control their properties such that they are highly metallic, or reasonably insulating, or anything in between. And that's what makes them so useful. Now, early on, people avoided semiconductors because early work in semiconductors were with materials that had unknown concentrations of defects in them that were producing all kinds of effects that made it very difficult to understand what was going on and very difficult to reproduce any experiment. Things have changed, and we are now able to grow very high purity silicon and reproducibly introduce we, dopants or defects that we intentionally put in to change the electronic properties in specific ways, and that's what makes them useful. That's how we make devices. So let's talk about how this works. This is our cartoon of the silicon or semiconductor lattice again. Each filled circle represents an atom. Each line represents a covalent bond. Each atom has four nearest neighbors. So we have the shared valence electrons here, and we have the core atoms uh, here. Now, what do we mean by doping? By doping, it means that we introduce other atoms into the crystalline lattice. For example, we might introduce phosphorus or arsenic, and we would call this n-type or negative doping. I'll explain in just a minute what we mean by that. Or we might introduce an atom like gallium or boron, and we would call that p-type or positive doping, and I'll explain that in a minute also. So to understand how this works, we go back to our periodic table. Remember, let's talk about common, a common semiconductor like silicon. If we look at silicon, it's got four valence electrons. We will find that the n-type dopants come from column five, right? Column five has five valence electrons. The p-type dopants come from column three. Column three has three valence electrons. So if we look at column uh, five, we can see atoms like arsenic, phosphorus. These are n-type dopants. If we look at column three, we can see atoms like boron, aluminum, gallium. These are p-type dopants. So how does this all work? Well, let's look at n-type doping first. Let's say that we are able to introduce, we're able to replace one of the silicon atoms in the lattice with an atom from column five, phosphorus or arsenic. Well, column five has five valence electrons, so it's no problem sharing four of those with the four nearest neighbors and satisfying those covalent bonds. But there is one electron left over, and that one electron now it turns out to be very weakly bound to the phosphorus or arsenic atom. The binding energy is a tenth of an electron volt or less. So it's weakly bound. It's very easy at room temperature to break the thermal energy and break that bond, and that produces an electron that can wander around in the crystal lattice. After we've broken that bond, we now, remember, we needed that fifth electron to, to make the phosphorus atom neutral. We had an equal number of electrons and positively charged protons in the nucleus, and all of the net charge then added up to zero. Now that we've broken the bond and the electron is free to wander away throughout the silicon lattice, the phosphorus atom is ionized. It's let, left with a net positive charge. We would call this an ionized donor. Now, if the concentration of the phosphorus atoms, I'll label the concentration as ND, the number of atoms per cubic centimeter. What's going to be important, though, is the number that are ionized. I'll label that as ND+, plus because an ionized donor has a positive charge. Ionized donors have donated an electron to the conduction band and achieved the doping that we're after. Now, if I look at the concentration of electrons in the conduction band, there are some intrinsic carriers there that were before we did this, one times 10 to the 10th per cubic centimeter. 
Typical doping concentrations overwhelm those intrinsic carriers so that the concentration of electrons in the conduction band is equal to the concentration of ionized donors. It's equal to the number of phosphorus atoms that have donated their atoms to the conduction band. That's the principle of doping. Now, just a reminder, once again, to be careful about units. We always quote these concentrations per cubic centimeter. Uh, proper SI units would be per cubic meter. The safest way to do homework problems and calculations is to do them in SI units first and then convert per cubic meter to per, per cubic centimeter. Now, let's look at, let's try to talk just a little bit about trying to understand the weak binding energy of this fifth electron, the one that's left over after the other four electrons share in the covalent bonding process. Remember, the hydrogen atom had only one electron and one proton. That's sort of like what we have here. All of the other electrons and, uh, have been accounted for in covalent bonds. We have one left over. We have a net positive charge of one. They're being held together in something that sort of looks like a hydrogen atom. We had a formula for the binding energy of hydrogen atoms, and when we put in numbers and n equals 1, that ends up being about minus 13.6 electron volts. Phosphorus in silicon behaves like a hydrogen atom in silicon. One of the important differences is that the dielectric constant, epsilon, is much higher than vacuum. In fact, the relative dielectric constant of silicon, the K sub s, is about 12. Uh, that quantity is squared, so that's over 100. So the binding energy of this fifth phosphorus atom in silicon is going to be much less. Put in numbers, and it's on the order of a tenth of an electron volt. Now, if you do the calculation a little more carefully and account for details, you'll find that it's actually even less than that, more like 0 0.05 electron volts, which is a very weakly bound electron, easily broken at room temperature. Okay. Well, how would we draw this, this uh, doping process on an energy band diagram? Remember, an energy band diagram is a plot of energy versus position. And these are, we're going to use energy band diagrams to understand devices throughout this course. The energy band diagrams that we've been drawing list the top of the valence band and the bottom of the conduction band. What if we have doped this semiconductor? What changes? Well, what changes is that we now have introduced states into the forbidden region where there are supposed to be no states, where there are no states in a pure lattice, but now we have introduced phosphorus atoms. When the electrons are bound to those phosphorus atoms, they're on one of those phosphorus atoms. These are localized states. The electron is sitting on some specific phosphorus atom. It is a small energy below the conduction band. If we break that energy and release the electron, we now have an empty state in the phosphorus. It, it acquires a positive charge. It's now ionized, and that electron is now in the conduction band. So this is the way we draw n-type doping on an energy band diagram. Just for some typical numbers, we might be talking about a moderate doping density of 10 to the 18th per cubic centimeter. Silicon has a very nice property. Phosphorus in silicon, arsenic in silicon, have nice properties that the, uh, that the bonds of the fifth electron are very weak, easily broken at room temperature. So the concentration of ionized dopants at room temperature is virtually identical to the concentration of dopant atoms. And that means that the concentration of electrons in the conduction band is also equal to the number of ionized dopants. Because remember, the intrinsic carrier density was 10 to the tenth per cubic centimeter. We've overwhelmed those intrinsic carriers with these extrinsic carriers. Now, we might ask, what is P? We haven't changed anything in the valence band. P was 10 to the tenth per cubic centimeter to begin with. You know, is P still 10 to the tenth? Well, interestingly enough, it's different. It's even lower. And we'll talk about how to compute that later on in the course. Typical concentrations of dopants, a concentration of 10 to the 14th per cubic centimeter, would be considered a light doping. Uh, 
a concentration of 10 to the 20th would be considered a very heavy doping, about as heavy as we're able to dope it. Uh, there's a solid solubility limit of phosphorus or arsenic in silicon. But remember, the number of atoms per cubic centimeter is about 5 times 10 to the 22nd. So this is even when we dope the semiconductor as heavily as we can possibly dope it, fewer than 1% of the electrons are phosphorus atoms or arsenic atoms. Okay, let's talk about p-type doping. How does that work? If we replace one of the silicon atoms with an atom from column 3, we don't have enough electrons to share with the four nearest neighbors and make covalent bonds. One of those bonds is missing. We've got a hole in one of those bonds. So when we've done that, we have introduced a, a hole into the semiconductor lattice, but that hole is sitting at that specific boron atom. Now, when an adjacent electron hops in and fills up that hole, the boron atom now can, acquires a negatively charged. It's ionized. It was perfectly neutral when it had its three atoms, its three electrons, its three valence electrons. Now it's got four valence electrons. Now it acquires a negative charge. But this hole now is free to hop around and move throughout the silicon lattice. So ionized acceptors lead to concentrations of holes. Same notation. N sub A will be the concentration of acceptor atoms, boron or gallium or whatever. N sub A minus will be the number that have been ionized, that have acquired an extra electron and have created a hole and is now free to move about the silicon lattice. And the number of holes is going to be very nearly equal to the number of ionized acceptors because we're, again, we're going to overwhelm the intrinsic carrier concentration. We can draw p-type doping on an energy band diagram as also. Also, it works this way. Here's the valence band. Here's the conduction band. In order for an electron to hop from a covalent bond in to the, uh, in to fill up one of this, the missing bonds in the, in the boron atom, it takes a little bit of energy. So that energy is a little bit above the uh, top of the valence band. When the boron goes in, it's electrically neutral. There's a missing electron there in the bonding with its four nearest neighbors. When an electron from the conduction band hops up and occupies that site and fills the covalent bond, it's left behind a hole in the valence band. Okay. Again, we could ask ourselves, what have we done to the electron concentration in the conduction band? It turns out that we've actually lowered the electron concentration from its 10 to the 10th number before we put the doping in. We'll discuss why that occurs later on. The concentration of p-type dopants, again, a similar range. We're able to dope. A light doping would be about 10 to the 14th per cubic centimeter. A heavy doping, as heavy as we could possibly do, would be about 10 to the 20th per cubic centimeter. Now, I'll just mention, one of the nice things about silicon is that we have nice dopants. Dopants that are fully ionized at room temperature. If the binding energy between these fifth electrons is significantly larger, than kT, then it will be difficult to take that fifth electron and move it into the conduction band, or to take a valence band electron and move it into the dopant and create the hole in the valence band. In that case, we call these deep because they're energetically deep. A deep donor would be one that is hard to, to ionize because it has a strong bonding energy. A deep acceptor would be one that is high, uh, hard to energize. Many semiconductors uh, have this property that their dopants are a little deeper than they are in silicon so that the dopants are not fully ionized at room temperature. For silicon, life is simple, and for the rest of the course, we'll be focusing on this simple case that applies to silicon devices. On the other hand, we would call the dopants in silicon shallow. They're energetically shallow. There's a very small energy difference that, that it takes to release that fifth electron and put it in the conduction band. Okay, let's make things a little more complicated. Let's take a semiconductor like gallium arsenide, and let's put silicon in gallium arsenide. Remember, gallium is column 3, arsenic is column 5. On average, they have four valence electrons per atom. Silicon is column 4. It has four valence electrons per atom. 
So we can ask ourselves, is this, is this going to be an N-type dopant? Is it going to be a P-type dopant? Maybe it could be either one. Uh, maybe it doesn't do either one of those things. So let's think about this a little bit and let's see if we can understand this. All right, here's how I think about it. Here's our silicon lattice. The gallium arsenide lattice is simple. We don't call it the diamond lattice, we call it the zinc blend lattice, but the structure is the same. The only difference is that every gallium atom is surrounded by four arsenic nearest neighbors. And every arsenic atom is surrounded by four gallium atoms. So the structure just alternates. We call this structure a zinc blend structure. So that's the crystal structure of gallium arsenide, very similar to the diamond structure of silicon, just two different types of atoms. In our little cartoon, we would draw it this way. Every gallium atom is surrounded by four arsenic atoms. Every arsenic atom is surrounded by four gallium atoms. All right, so let's ask ourselves then what happens. We're trying to understand what happens when we dope gallium arsenide with silicon. So let's put a silicon atom in, and let's put a silicon atom on a gallium site. A gallium site, gallium has, is from column three, it has three valence electrons. Silicon is from column four, it has four column, uh, four valence electrons. So we have one extra electron now. That means that silicon, if it happens to be sitting on a gallium site, is a donor. Okay. You go through the same argument and put silicon on the arsenic site. Arsenic is from column five, silicon is from column four. Then silicon has one fewer electrons than the arsenic atom it replaced. So silicon on an arsenic site is an acceptor. So we call silicon an amphoteric dopant. Amphoteric means it can dope either N-type or P-type depending on which atom it replaces in the lattice. And depending on exactly how we introduce these dopants and exactly how we do the annealing, we can favor one site versus the other, so we can make N-type dopants versus P-type dopants. All right, so that's a little bit about doping. Now let's ask ourselves, how does the carrier concentration vary with temperature? So we have this situation, a good, N-type dopant with shallow dopants, the energy level here is very uh, small, easily ionized at room temperature. But if we go down to zero Kelvin, there is no thermal energy. All of the fifth electrons would be sitting on their phosphorus or arsenic sites. There would be no electrons in the conduction band. There would be no ionized donors. So we would have no intrinsic carriers due to doping. We would also have no intrinsic carriers due to thermal excitation across the band gap because Ni would be zero because there's no thermal energy to break the covalent bonds. If we heat the temperature up somewhat, we'll start breaking those weak bonds and creating a few electrons in the conduction band. So now we have some electrons in the conduction band. If we heat up to 300 Kelvin, then Phosphorus or arsenic and silicon are good dopants. They're fully ionized at 300 Kelvin, and we have one electron in the conduction band for every phosphorus atom that was put in the crystal lattice. If, however, we continue and heat the lattice up even more, we start breaking the covalent bonds and creating electron hole pairs by thermal excitation across the band gap. Now we can create many intrinsic carriers that overwhelm the doping, and it's just as though the doping weren't there. So when that happens, the semiconductor has become intrinsic then. Even though we have dopants in the lattice, their concentration is small compared with the intrinsic carrier density. So just a couple of comments. At high temperatures, the intrinsic carriers produced by this thermal excitation about breaking the covalent bonds can overwhelm the doping. Now, we build semiconductor devices by selectively doping different regions in different ways. If we are operating these devices at high temperatures, we basically lost all of the properties of those dopants because we've overwhelmed them with these intrinsic carriers. Devices then fail. And this is one of the reasons that when you heat devices up to a temperature that is too hot, the devices will cease to function. 
So we can now understand that if we go into the lab and measure the electron concentration versus temperature, it'll have this basic characteristic. Near zero Kelvin, there won't be any electrons because there's no thermal energy to ionize the dopants or to break the covalent bonds. As we increase, no, we would call that region the freeze-out region. The carriers are freezing out to their dopants and they're localized on the specific dopants. There are no carriers. As we warm the semiconductor up, we begin breaking those bonds. And if we go to a high enough temperature, we have ionized all of the dopants. This is the extrinsic region, and we'll spend most of the course operating in this region. If we continue to heat up the semiconductor, we can get to a region where breaking the covalent bonds overwhelms the carriers that were produced by dopants. The semiconductor becomes intrinsic again, and the electron concentration increases greatly. So this is the basic behavior of electron concentration versus temperature. All right, we've covered a lot of ground, so let me summarize. Doping a semiconductor is what makes them useful. That's how we produce semiconductor devices. To dope a semiconductor, we replace a few of the atoms in the crystal lattice with atoms from different columns of the periodic table. Dopants that are ionized produce free carriers. An ionized donor produces free electrons in the conduction band. An ionized acceptor produces free holes in the valence band. These dopants can be either shallow or deep. A shallow dopant is easily ionized at room temperature and is an effective dopant. A deep donor or deep acceptor is hard to ionize at room temperature and is not as an effective dopant. The carrier concentration versus temperature uh, characteristic has a freeze-out region where all of the carriers uh, freeze out to their individual dopants. It has an extrinsic region where all of the dopants are fully ionized, contributing carriers to the conduction or valence band. And it has an intrinsic region where the breaking of the covalent bonds overwhelms all of the doping. And finally, I'll mention that at low temperatures, where there are no free carriers, all of the carriers are frozen out, the semiconductor becomes an insulator. In fact, one of the ways that an experimentalist who is exploring a new material determines whether he or she is dealing with a semiconductor or a metal is to lower the temperature to near absolute zero and see if it still continues to conduct electricity. If it does, it's a metal. If it becomes an insulator, it's a semiconductor. So we've covered a lot of ground in Unit 1, but, we, but we've introduced the basic concepts that we will return to and discuss and extend upon as we move forward in the course.